can I have your attention? Um, just let everybody know the food is open here now and the bar is open, so uh, please uh, make your way and open.
Hey guys, this is uh, this is Isaac Barkas from ATI. We uh, we're going to be live streaming this to several locations. So if y'all could start finding your seats now, we're going to start up in about uh, about 90 seconds. I'm, uh, I'm going to get James Earl Jones to say that next time. So please, do find your seats now. We're going to be starting up in about a minute. Say when. All right, y'all. We're going to kick it off. My name is uh, my name is Isaac Barkus. I run the Austin Technology Incubator at the IC Squared Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, my partner in crime is Dave Altunian from St. Ed's uh, University down the street. Yay! Bravo! Bravo! I, I appreciate the fact that my staff is cheering Dave. Thank you, staff. I, 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 that's 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 good. Um, so uh, welcome. This is um, my favorite thing that we do, my favorite event that we do at the Austin Technology Incubator. It's our uh, student entrepreneur acceleration and launch final event. Um, student entrepreneur acceleration and launch, or SEAL, is the uh, student accelerator that we run at the University of Texas at Austin through the Austin Technology Incubator. Uh, ATI has been around since 1989, so 27 years, and we've been running this program for the past, is this the eighth year, I think, that we've been running the, the Summer SEAL program. The, um, the goal behind this program, this particular accelerator, uh, was stimulated by the following. About 15% of R&D in America, about 15% of R&D is conducted at universities. But if you look at last year, 45% of the IPO value on the NASDAQ came out of universities. So 15% of R&D, 45% of IPO value. Universities are tremendous innovation engines, tremendous innovation engines. And most of the time, that innovation is captured not by faculty, but by students. Uh, the typical model is that students will take something interesting that's happening at the university and inject that virus-like, uh, for those who are doing biology. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate the biologist laughing. That's nice. Thank you very much. Um, inject that into, into a startup. And as we looked at the University of Texas, University of Texas has 62 different clubs, courses, programs, offices, etc., dedicated to entrepreneurship. But it didn't have a, um, a tool for students who are thinking about starting their company to really engage with, is this a business or not? And that's why we founded the, uh, the, the, the SEAL program. Um, this past year, um, with the generous support of the Kauffman Foundation, we've been able to collaborate with sister universities throughout the country uh, to try to take what we're doing at the Summer SEAL program at ATI and um, allow other students to participate in that, and then also allow us at ATI and the University of Texas to learn from other entrepreneurship programs. So this is a special year for us. Typically, we deal with seven, eight, nine student teams. This year, we started with, with 16, and we, uh, we um, uh, I'm getting a three-minute mark, so I need to sort of readjust myself. I had so much I wanted to say, um, and we're, we're finishing with, with 15 teams. Um, so tonight, we get to see the result of those teams, the work they've been doing to decide whether or not they're going to uh, actually go out and start a company. Uh, historically, about a third of the teams that go through this program get funded. About a third of them decide they're not going to go forward. Both of those, by the way, we consider successes. And about a third are still running. They're still profitable or they're sucking down their own resources or doing something like that. Those are the companies that we're not wild about. So hopefully tonight we're going to be driving to either a definite go or a definite no-go decision. Um, I would like to take just a minute and thank our sponsors. I mentioned the Kauffman Foundation. 
uh, without whom we could not have extended this to uh, the teams from outside of the University of Texas at Austin, without whom we could not have brought on, uh, brought on Dave Altunian to, to help us out. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank Google Fiber, who are allowing us to, to use this space. They've been a fantastic partner for this program going forward, uh, or going backwards, and hopefully going forward as well. And then uh, last but not at all least, I'd like to thank the two groups that made the alcohol possible. Uh, DLA Piper. Uh, do we have representatives from DLA in the audience? Okay, every, for everybody who applauded their lawyers. Um, so DLA Piper, they're actually a fantastic law firm. They've been engaged with ATI forever. We really, really appreciate the engagement they've had with us. And Beatbox, which is a startup company which came out of the University of Texas, didn't go through SEAL, but has been very successful. So to DLA Piper and Beatbox, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will turn it over. I will turn it over to Dave Altunian to give you the run of the show. Thank you, Isaac. So um, first of all, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we know it's tough here downtown with traffic and parking, but the teams really appreciate you being here. This is very different than a lot of uh, pitch presentations in that this isn't a pitch looking for money. These are teams that have come from universities or research labs that have already been part of an entrepreneurial program or uh, an incubator or accelerator and have identified their technology fits a, is a solution to a problem. What they don't know is whether or not they should commercialize it and take it to um, uh, to, to the marketplace as a real product. So what we do with SEAL is we pair them with mentors through the summer and they continue to validate their idea and validate their business. Uh, and then we do programming through this summer with um, speakers that do lunch and learns. And they've learned things like how to do pro formas, how to do product uh, roadmaps, um, how to do market validation, how to go out and get feedback from suppliers. All those things are done. And at the end of it, it culminates in today, which is decision day. And they get up and they talk about their problem and their solution that they've come up with and uh, what they've learned and what their plans are for going forward. And I'm really pleased to say that uh, I think almost all of the teams, if not all the teams, except for one, um, will be going forward in some level or another. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask our mentors and our speakers that are here if you could please stand up um, so we could recognize you i know you're in here um, and thank them it, it's really tough to get students during the summer to do work um, and so uh, the students already were signed up to do this getting mentors it takes a lot of commitment people have a lot going on in the off time so i want to thank them quite a bit um, so before I start, I also want to uh, second what Isaac said about um, the, the sponsors. They've made this possible all summer. I think the students have had a, a good experience. It's been a lot of work. Everybody's glad to have this done. With that, I'd like to bring up the first team because I know that's what you all are interested in, and that is Digit Medical. Thanks, David and Isaac. Well, hi everyone, my name is Victor Schwartz and I'm one of the co-founders of Digit. We develop pre-diagnostic software for orthopedic clinics, making the process of receiving treatment faster and easier. We all know getting injured sucks. I experienced this firsthand a few years ago when I was playing soccer with some of my friends and I ended up really badly hurting my back. Even though I was in a lot of pain, all I could think about was how quickly could I get back on the field doing what I love to do. I was shocked. It took me almost four months before I was able to receive treatment. And the amount of time wasn't because of the injury itself. It was because the process of receiving treatment is so inefficient. I had to go in multiple times to see my surgeon, and many times I didn't even feel as if the visits were fully necessary. This inefficient process wasn't unique to my situation at all. It's actually a very common problem within orthopedics. Over the past few months, we've spoken to over 50 surgeons trying to understand what's leading to these inefficiencies. What we found in talking to the surgeons is that many of them felt that if they were able to collect specific information about their patient's condition and treatment preferences before the actual appointment, they would be able to spend their time with the patient in a more meaningful and efficient manner. The problem with this 
is that the only way this information is collected today is in a few blanket questions at the end of a really long patient intake form, like this one. Even though it looks long and complicated, it actually can't collect this sort of information. So what we're doing instead is we've worked with a team of leading orthopedic surgeons to develop question algorithms, which allow us to collect specific information about a patient's condition and treatment preferences in a quick and efficient manner. Our software utilizes a dynamic question engine, which means it begins by asking a patient about their chief complaint and then dynamically generates the following questions based on the previous answers given by the patient. This allows us to collect the specific information about the patient's condition in a very methodical way. This information is then sent directly to the surgeon via our web application, allowing them to prepare for the upcoming appointment and potentially even treat the patient on the first visit. By using our software to optimize patient visits, surgeons can make up to 13 times as much revenue in the same time spent with a patient. Unlike our competitors, we've figured out how to capture the core diagnostic experience of a surgeon and distill it into a pre-diagnostic tool, which fits seamlessly into the, into the clinical workflow before the patient is even onboarded into the patient portal. We'll sell directly to orthopedic clinics and we'll charge them using a monthly subscription model based on the number of surgeons using our software. We've chosen this model because of the value we provide in the patient treatment process on a recurring basis, as well as how we integrate into the clinical workflow. We will begin by targeting orthopedic outpatient centers, but specifically at first, orthopedic hand groups. We've chosen this subspecialty as our beachhead because of the way because the treatment processes, processes and the conditions are especially conducive to our software. We've just begun beta testing our software in a clinic in Ohio, and we're gonna to continue to do so while we continue refining our question algorithms and proving that our software brings a, a substantial return on investment for the surgeons. Next, we'll expand our beta testing to include five clinics total. And in this phase, we will understand the necessary protocols and personnel required to implement our software in a variety of clinical settings. Once we graduate from the beta testing phase, we'll fully launch and be available nationwide. And in this phase, we'll expand our software to include question algorithms, which encompass all the different orthopedic subspecialties. Also in this time, we will begin to pursue institutional funding, which we'll use to accelerate our expansion into all the different subspecialties and to recruit all the necessary personnel. In addition to that, our preliminary market research has indicated that similar problems exist in other medical specialties outside of the orthopedic realm. And so we will target these areas for expansion going forward. Our team is composed of four Duke computer science students, one wonderful designer, two orthopedic surgeons, and one orthopedic advisor, who also happens to be the associate dean of the Dell Medical School, which is pretty cool. <laughs> At the beginning of the ATICO program this summer, all we had was an idea of a problem that maybe just a few orthopedic surgeons were facing. So we set out to validate the problem and our solution in a broader sense across the orthopedic market. Once we were able to do so, we focused our attention on turning our idea into a full-fledged business. And without the help of the ATICO program, with the incredible uh, resources and mentors they had to offer, I don't know where we would even be right now. <laughs> Back in June, Dave and Isaac, Isaac asked us to decide by this date whether or not we would continue working on our, on our company. And so I'm here to say that we will absolutely continue working on Digit and we're extremely excited to do so. Thank, thank you everyone for listening. And I'd love to talk to any investors, medical professionals, entrepreneurs, or anyone else in the audience that just thinks our logo looks awesome, because it does. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'd love to introduce the next team, Texas Guadalupe. Hello, everyone. <laughs> So can anyone tell me what is significant about the year 1903? 
1903 was the year that the Wright brothers had their first manned flight, which means it's been over 100 years since then, and we still use boats, planes, trains, and cars to move around. 100 years, and I'm still like, where the hell is my flying car? <laughs> there has to be a better way. My name is Deborah Navarro, and I'm a founder of Texas Guadalupe. We're working with SpaceX to make the Hyperloop a reality. Elon Musk called upon a competition for engineering teams all around the world to begin building a prototype pod to run on a vacuum tube test track. Texas Guadalupe combines the convenience of a train with the speed of a plane. We've designed an energy efficient model that can travel at speeds of up to 750 miles an hour. Let that sink in a bit. Traveling at 750 miles an hour would get you from a major city like Austin to Dallas in just 20 minutes. And we envisioned there would be capsules departing every 30 minutes carrying about 30 people. So there are two ways in which teams plan to levitate the pod. The first is through magnetic levitation. But Elon Musk explicitly stated himself that magnetic levitation is cost prohibitive and not sustainable for a full scale system. This is why it came to our surprise that 90% of our competitors, other student teams implemented maglev just because it had been proven to work. However, what's so cool is that, you know, we are using air bearings and they've never been tested at high velocities. And we are the first team in the world proving that they work. So how does a hyperloop really work? So this is our actual prototype. So imagine an air hockey table where air is being pumped out of the table, allowing your puck to levitate and glide smoothly and quickly with little air. But just reverse that, and instead air being generated from the puck, or in this case, our pod. And that is essentially what those six red boxes at the base of our pod or our air bearings do. So three reasons why magnetic levitation won't work. It's expensive to build, and it's expensive to build the infrastructure for. Two, it's energy consuming, and it's not environmentally friendly in any way whatsoever. And three, it goes half the speed as air bearings do. And as for the high speed rail, the reason why I stand before you today is because Elon Musk announced this competition in response to the high speed rail currently being built from LA to San Francisco that's going to cost over $70 billion. And that's an incremental advancement in technology for such a huge price tag. So, as for a competitive advantage within the Hyperloop, our prototype is just under $30,000, which is unheard of. And our competitors have really cool and fancy designs on paper, but their build costs exceed $100,000. And that is not even intended to transport people. Um, and you know, like the, our greatest strength is our actual team. And we really have worked together from the beginning of this with 100% devotion. We have expertise in all fields of engineering from civil to mechanical and aerospace. And we know how to get a project like this done. But the strength and the heart of our team is in the entirety of our team. We're PhD students, we're master's students, and this means we've worked in the lab and we've worked in the industry and we have the type of experience to get a project like this done. We also have an amazing team of mentors behind us. SEAL's been instrumental in helping us transition from a startup into like an actual full-fledged company. And one of our biggest milestones through SEAL was actually getting in touch with NASA. NASA has been so working with us so well and like allowing us to use their vacuum chambers. And we've currently been restricted to only using a small chamber, which has only allowed us to test individual components of our pod. But using their large vacuum chambers, we would be able to test our entire, entire pod would function in a vacuum, which would be really important because we would see any potential red flags before transporting it to SpaceX in January for the competition. So there are three main opportunities that we find that we will ultimately take. For one, we could be the team building out the pod or assembling it. Two, we could be the team building out a certain subsystem like the air bearings that I talked with you about earlier. Or three, we could become safety consultants for the Hyperloop. We really learn to be test experts in getting NASA to open their doors for us. So here are a few of our sponsors, and I'll close with, to, with you today with our decision as to whether or not we're going to continue. So 
without a doubt, we're moving forward. We all met under a year ago and we've accomplished so much since then. Um, we, we were selected along with top engineering teams from around the world to present to SpaceX in January. We've raised over $50,000 without any equity dilution. We've dominated and pitched competitions focused on clean energy. And we were actually able to accomplish levitation off our air bearings this past month. And we were sponsored by top engineering companies such as Lockheed and Martin, Airfloat, Ryan, Stahl, Swagelock, and countless friends and family who really believe in us. And we are just happy to be a catalyst in getting this necessary and past due conversation on transportation going. And come January, we're gonna prove this isn't some idea out of science fiction, but indeed a soon reality. And 2017 will be known as the year that the Hyperloop disrupts the transportation industry. Thank you. So Lisa Wilmore will open up with Stratometis. Thanks, Deborah. So Deborah and I came out of the same program um, a year ago, the MSTC program at UT. So while my friends and I were studying at MSTC, we figured out that there was a problem that we had discovered. With our combined expertise in oil and gas industry, plus 40 years of experience, and also with a very dedicated team at Texas A&M, we discover one, in, one situation in the oil and gas industry. Let me tell you a little story about Elaine. Elaine's a geophysicist. She spends most of her day looking at data that's being collected on site of potential well sites and doing manual interpretation of this information. Not a really big problem in your perspective, but when you're collecting more than 20 terabytes up to petabytes of data, that's a lot of interpretation to be done manually in a queued process. Now, that's only one factor of the problem. There's not just one Elaine. There's five to 10 Elaines working on the same well site at the same time. And on average, it could take up to four to six weeks to get the right interpretation of a go, no go decision. So for Elaine, we found some challenges. The variety of the information that you're collecting because of the advanced sensor, sensors that are available in oil and gas industry comes in very unstructured formats. There's a lot of information collected, but all this data, what is the company gonna do with it when it's a manually queued process? It's a delay process, and when there's capital investments of all these sensors upwards of 500 million or minimum of 300 million, it's sidling idly by without any decisions to be made. So, to help Elaine and her nine other friends, we found that there's actually a better solution when you can interpret this information of a scalable format. So the team that we were working with, we spent over a year and a half on this. Um, we've had oil and gas, high performance computing team from Texas A&M, and also the licensing manager, and of course, the support of NSF with a million dollars, a solution called Desperado King to Solution. What it is, it's a scalable parallel computing platform that can build semi-automatic or automatic machine learning models. What is machine learning? You've heard this probably in everyday language. What it is basically is something that you feed information to. And the more information, more data of acquired well sites that's already been proven sites that's no longer being used or abandoned, you're teaching it to build a better model of where the, excuse me, of where the fault lines are and also the geological formation below surface. When you're looking below ground, you have to be more accurate. And what has been found with this solution, it's up to 95% accuracy with models in existence and what is outputting from the machine. It's very easy to use for those that have never used a platform like this. It's dragging your information in from all the data you've acquired and then running your algorithms. Some com most companies have proprietary information or also preloaded algorithms that's already within the system. And then compute a model and determine whether precisely, perhaps, is there hydrocarbon deposits. So to really further validate the information of this product, we did 125 market validation interviews with geophysicists, geoscientists, and engineers. And 87% have said if there was an analytic solution to speed up the process from four to six weeks to a, a faster rate, they can make a better decision and quicker decision. Well, what does this mean to a business? So in terms of, say, one average well site that costs $10 million, 
When you're looking at a 90% savings of one person's time, you're essentially saving about $1.22 million on one area. And what you can do with this is actually build a better model to predict your future decision making. So when further interviewed 400 executives who across industry using analytics within their companies, they are five times more likely to be in a top 25 percentile of the financial standings within their industry and twice as likely to make decisions that are quicker than their peers and three times as likely to execute on those decisions without those analytics. So for our model, what we're going to offer is a licensing seat with a software development kit, of course, consulting services with technical staff, and also third, maintenance opportunities. So we're projecting maybe in four years, we're looking at a proper return of this platform. Now out of the hundreds of oil and gas field service companies collecting this data for the big operators who is analyzing this information, we're only gonna target locally as our target market, which is 20 oil and gas field service companies out of Houston. So at $500,000 a seat, that is our first addressable market of the target of $10 million. Here is our roadmap. In 2016, what we have already tested is information from New Zealand, Oklahoma, so Colorado School of Mines, and also Australia. With 95% accuracy of the gigabytes of data that we're testing, we're now looking for the first beta client to test a bigger amount of data to really truly prove that this is a viable product at a scalable rate. And in 2017, alpha testing, 2018, beta testing and launch in 2019. So we've been working on this for the past year and a half with a and um, What we had learned, actually, we actually changed the complete model. We understood that there were some gaps within the model that we previously had after our learnings. And during the last three months, we had learned there is some deep-seated knowledge that's necessary. So with just one leading professor working on the high-performance computing and two graduate students, there actually needs to be more technical staff available to be supporting this information not just a beta test partner, but geophysicists and also engineers. And so we thank ATI for providing this time and opportunity and also our mentors, Oliver Lawrence and Lewis Houston for guiding us down this path. So the possibility is likely for this company, but it does need a partner and it does need the right data to test for scalability. Thanks very much. My name is Jessica Linville, and I am from Argonne National Lab. I'm here representing the Ready Water Pretreatment System, creating water ready for use in cooling towers. Freshwater stress and scarcity is an emerging issue in the United States, especially in the southwestern part of the US, who has been suffering from extreme and lasting drought. We are specifically focused on the half a million cooling towers using five trillion gallons of fresh water per year. Because of this enormous amount of water being used, there's a need to conserve water for cooling towers. We believe this can be achieved in two different ways. The first one is through increased cycles of filtration within the cooling tower by improving the water quality by removing the total dissolved solids or using alternative water sources such as reclaimed brackish or processed water, which typically have higher total dissolved solids. Your incumbent chemical treatment systems can achieve these two types of savings. They manage the poor water quality, they don't improve the water quality. However, the ready water system does. The ready water system uses electricity to remove the total dissolved solids from the makeup water stream, which reduces the scaling, fouling, and corrosion within the cooling tower system. What this means to the owner and operator of the cooling tower is that it, they use 30% less water, 40% less chemicals, and reduce their operating costs by 30% as well. It also enables them to use alternative water such as reclaimed water. We envision our system being installed upstream of the cooling tower and treating the water before it gets to the cooling tower, improving the water quality. Our go-to-market strategy is quite simple. As I said, we're a water treatment OEM. We build our widget and the cooling tower owner operator are end users. 
we are going to go to market by partnering with the water treatment service companies that typically service these cooling towers now because there's a number of benefits to doing this. The first one is that the partner has an established customer base and sales uh, force in order to reach our end users. And we're also going to incentivize them installing our units through a shared service contract um, with the, the partner as well. And this also means less chemical hazards for both the partner and the end user, which we've heard multiple times is something that they're really interested in. Uh, so our company roadmap, it's a 24 month roadmap. Uh, we finished participating in the SEAL program. Uh, hopefully within the next couple of months, we'll form the new company. As I said before, I'm here as Argonne National Lab and form a partnership with an investor. Uh, we are then going to simultaneously uh, start licensing the IP from Argonne and develop a CRADA, which is a cooperative research and development agreement with the investor, the new company, and Argonne. This will allow us to test out multiple proof points that we've heard are still necessary um, to get the prototype to the point where then we can implement our go-to-market strategy and partner with our first water treatment service company, hopefully in the second quarter of 2018. Uh, the team right now consists of all Argonne employees. I would be leaving the lab to start the new company as the CEO. And through the CRADA, we'd still have access to Yupo Lin and Seth Snyder, who've been developing this technology over the last 10 years. We have learned a lot during the CEO program. I don't think it would be possible for us to have gotten to the point that we are now without participating in the SEAL program. Uh, we went through the LabCorp program, so we had a good understanding of what the market was and what the needs were, but we had no idea how to build a business. Was this something we could even make money at? Now, because of SEAL, I can say yes. So the first thing we learned was about the steps to licensing the IP from Argon. Uh, this was difficult being Argon employees. It created a barrier for discussion. Uh, we also looked at our market analysis. When I came here, I had a target market of about 5,000 customers in the Southwest at institutions such as universities, hospitals, and data centers, and had estimated an abysmal 21 million 10-year market worth. Uh, what we quickly realized is that I failed to take into account the number of cooling towers at each site and the number of units each cooling tower would need. Uh, so we are now up to about 75,000 units for those same 5,000 customers uh, and a much more reasonable $22.6 billion market worth. And so we're hoping to accomplish 25% of the market or about 15,000 units or $1.5 billion, uh, which we think is extremely reasonable uh, given the fact that we are only focused on the Southwest for now. Uh, we also, oh, what did I do? There we go. Uh, we also looked at the company financials. Uh, I'm an engineer and I have no business sense uh, when I started this. And so trying to develop a pro forma was absolutely mind boggling. Uh, however, uh, David spent a lot of time with me developing this. And so now not only do I understand it, I can defend it, which is invaluable. Uh, but the takeaway from this is that we need less than a million dollars uh, to get profitable in year three. And in year five, we're selling 100 units and generated about $16 million in revenue with 50% gross margins. Uh, we also looked at the customer economic analysis. Uh, being part of the SEAL program allowed me access uh, to the facility services here at UT Austin. Um, and they gave me a bunch of good data so I could understand what our system could do for their cooling towers. Um, and with this, we figured we use very conservative numbers um, and determined that we have a return on investment in less than three years. Uh, so at this point, we are a go. Um, and this is a white deer that is famous at Argonne um, and across the, the different national labs. It's a German breed of deer. Thank you. Okay, we are gonna give people a five minute break while we switch out teams. Please uh, grab something to drink and grab some food and we will be back in five minutes.
<laughs> oh, here's your clicker. Wait, where's the where's the clicker? You just have to click. Okay, it'll be on. Yeah. All right, we're gonna start again right away here. So to keep uh, this moving forward, I'd like to introduce uh, everybody. Can we just quiet down a little bit? We're going to go on with the next team. This is going to be JP Dowling and Recollect Energy. Can I give them a minute? No, no. We don't have time. Right, that's why I want right. to go. Okay. All right, everybody. My name is JP Dowling. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Recollect Energy. We're redefining waste heat recovery by manufacturing new energy harvesting systems that convert heat directly into electricity. Why is this important? Well, let's look. This is a graph of all of the energy that's produced and consumed in the United States. On the left, you see the various sources, and on the right, the sectors that consume them. As you can see at the very end, it breaks down how much energy is successfully used and how much is lost as rejected energy or waste heat. 60% of the energy produced in the United States is ultimately lost as waste heat. Of all the sectors, transportation is the least efficient at only 20% efficiency, meaning that 80% of the fuel they burn is just lost. So how can we fix this? Recollect Energy manufactures thermoelectric generators that convert heat to electricity at a temperature range between 350 and 500 degrees Celsius. So this is one, significantly higher than any other thermoelectric generator on the market, and also the temperature range where most heat is wasted. At this temperature range, typically you would recover the heat with a steam turbine system, but this is too complex for a lot of smaller installations. That's where we come in. So every thermoelectric generator is made up of thermoelectric modules or the basic building block. These modules are about five centimeters square and when applied to heat, generate about 20 watts of electricity, which is thanks to a 40% efficiency boost that comes from two key pieces of intellectual property out of the University of Houston. We have secured an exclusive worldwide license to these technologies and the inventor is our CTO. So let's go back to the transportation sector that I mentioned before. Specifically, 18-wheeler trucks. Though these trucks only account for 6% of vehicle miles, they, per they consume an outsized 17% of highway fuel in the United States and emit 30% of highway emissions. Because of this outsized impact, the EPA is requiring them to become 40% more efficient over the next decade. We can solve some of this problem by mounting 75 or so thermoelectric modules in the exhaust stream of an 18-wheeler truck. Doing this and capturing the electricity from the exhaust heat allows us to disengage the belt-driven alternator that would otherwise power the truck. This removes load from the engine and improves fuel efficiency by about 5%. This system on a truck today at today's diesel prices would pay for itself in about 1.6 years. And by the time we're able to bring it to market in three or four years, we'll be able to offer a, a one and a half year or less payback period which out of all the fleets and truck manufacturers we've talked to is the point at which they really get interested. We came into this summer thinking we could go straight for that heavy truck market, but what we quickly realized is that that's just not possible. So what we're doing instead is starting off by just manufacturing our modules as a component. There are a limited number of manufacturers that use these modules in systems today. And so it's a relatively small market, but one we can enter quickly. From that point, we'll be able to generate enough modules to begin prototyping and working with an oil field services company to create a natural gas flare that harvests the heat from the gas that is flared. This can power operations at wellheads around the country. From that point, we can jump into the heavy truck market that I talked about earlier. This market is about $1.3 billion in the United States in terms of just waste, waste heat recovery hardware. This is also an excellent springboard to the consumer auto market, which is sort of the holy grail of waste heat recovery markets. In the US alone, we estimate that about $10 billion a year of waste heat recovery systems could be sold. Of course, that's all in the future. Today in our lab, we have a very small prototype and over the next month, we're working on building the first full-scale module prototype. 
This is something that will allow us to validate our technology as if we were taking it to market. Over the next six months, we're looking to raise about $400,000 in seed capital, $50,000 from a grant from the University of Houston, and an additional $350,000 in a seed round we hope to close by January. Our team consists of myself and Laura Mahaney, two graduates of the Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship, and technology inventor Dr. Ching Ji, who is a material scientist at the Texas Center for Superconductivity at the University of Houston. Our team works closely with lead inventor Dr. Ji Fang Ren, who has developed these kinds of technologies for more than a decade. I also want to give a huge thanks to our ATI SEAL mentors this summer, Lou, Jeremy, and Bill, who all contributed in their own way and really helped us move forward. So the markets that I talked about earlier are just the beginning for Recollect Energy. From consumer auto to military vehicles, diesel trains and even jet engines, we can empower more efficient, more advanced technology wherever there is enough heat. We came in this summer to ATI SEAL with the well, year's worth of interviews, assumptions and research. And we quickly realized that most of those were just very bad. Um, so we were able to rebuild from the ground up, especially our go-to-market strategy and a lot of the understanding we had around our competitive advantage and our intellectual property. All of that is thanks to the awesome team, staff, mentors, guest speakers that ATI made available to us this summer, and we feel like we're much better positioned to move forward. So with that, I'm happy to announce the Recollect Energy as a definite go. We're really excited to see where the future takes us, and if anybody's interested in our technology, we'd really like to talk to you. Again, my name is JP Dowling with Recollect Energy, redefining waste heat recovery. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Clean Reach. You ready to go? Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, my name is Barrett Morrow with Clean Reach, and I've got a little story for you today. So, oh. <laughs> Oh, other way. All right, there it is. <laughs> so about three months ago, our, one of our founders, Dr. Timothy Rydell, who can be seen sitting in the back corner over there, began to feel mysteriously ill. Uh, three trips to the doctor, three ineffective prescriptions, and five lost working days later, he finally began to unravel the source of a mysterious illness. And you're never, ever going to guess what it was. Fecal matter in a public body of water in a park. That's right. Poop in the very lights and streams that your children probably swim in. As a developed first world nation, we lack the capability to effectively track and monitor biocontaminants in a way that is cost effective and easy to perform. We here at Clean Reach find this absolutely unacceptable. And we're, as a molecular diagnostic company, we aim to empower our consumers to have the knowledge and power of a scientist, no PhD required. Did you know that annually 16.4 million cases of waterborne illness are diagnosed in the United States? In 2012, we spent $970 million treating such illnesses. Furthermore, food and beverage contamination also resulted in one in six cases of illness, resulting in 128,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths. How has this problem gotten to this point? Many would point fingers at uh, water quality authorities that are using over 100-year-old technology to conduct their tests, oftentimes resulting in unnecessary and sadly preventable deaths. Currently in the uh, water quality testing market, there's a lack of a clear industry leader that can offer both detailed and timely reports that do not break the bank. Secondly, uh, existing services require the, uh, a full-blown laboratory with expensive equipment and trained personnel to both run and interpret the tests. Lastly, with results taking seven to 10 days to be returned to consumers, many contaminated sources are not identified until it is simply too late. What if there were a platform that could help us to identify biocontaminants in less than an hour? Luckily, there are other uh, solutions than the current yet inefficient gold standard. Um, our platform can deliver results in less than an hour and is so easy to use that a local group of high school students has been able to successfully use it to test water quality in a nearby creek on UT campus. In order to help facilitate this, we've completely taking out interpretation error in our device by digitizing result analysis and allowing it to be uploaded to our CleanReach smartphone application. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you RIPB, a reprogrammable platform for the identification of biocontaminants. As you can see here in the uh, center picture, there are two green tubes. So when the DNA that we're looking for is present, the tubes light up green, and this is the basis of how our technology works. 
Now, this test, however, is not only limited to testing for fecal matter and water, but can be used to test for anything of biological origin. In the future, we hope to develop our technology to the point where our customers are able to help monitor biological supply chains across the globe and alert, their, alert them to problems as they arise in real time. Looking forward, we plan to offer both conventional water quality testing services and our new technology, RIP-B, in order to immediately generate revenue and to gain valuable customer knowledge into the problems that they face every day to be able to better incorporate those needs into future iterations of our technology. And here I have an uh, example of our box, so it's not just an idea, it's a very real thing. Um, and so initially we, uh, we plan to target uh, both public and private water uh, testing facilities as well as rural municipal water authorities who may or may not have the lab infrastructure for, uh, to run these very complicated tests. And so we hope that these early relationships with customers that we do our conventional testing for will allow us to identify unserved uh, niche markets in the water quality testing arena to allow us to continue to develop more tests for our RIPB platform to, to basically allow us to offer more services to them so they don't have to use the old technology. And so as we continue to expand the number of tests we offer for our RIPB platform, we plan to eventually phase out, as you can see here, our uh, the gold standard refers to the conventional services that are offered, and so we plan to eventually phase that out as we can offer enough uh, tests for our RIPB platform to be its own standalone product. And in the sixth quarter, which we, the first quarter for us sh should be this fall, so about a year and a half, uh, we plan to be selling more RIPB platforms and associated cartridges than the, uh, the gold standard. And as our, uh, as our technology uh, reaches into its rightful throne as the uh, gold standard in water quality testing, we hope to identify other markets where our technology is applicable. And you know, a couple of examples of this, uh, of things we would love to be able to do, is to test your Chipotle to see if there's E. coli in it, or maybe perhaps to, to test your Bluebell to make sure that you're not going to eat any Listeria. So these are just a couple ideas of what we'd like to do with our technology in the future. Uh, here's our wonderful team, uh, myself, Jessica, Andy Ellington, Tim Rydell, and uh, Sanchita Badra, as well with our ATI mentor, uh, Bart. Uh, this, this strong core team is able to gu guarantee innovation for years to come as the needs for more complex biomonitoring solutions becomes apparent. This summer at ATI, we've made some tremendous progress that we would have not otherwise made without the, uh, I guess you would call it rearing of uh, <laughs> the institute. Uh, our, we've gotten feedback and interacted with key industry leaders um, that we've been able to incorporate that into the design of our product. We've clarified our immediate monetization strategy by deciding to offer conventional water testing and have also mostly clarified our long-term monetization strategy in that we'll be using a razor blade pricing model where we offer our platform for a very cheap price and garner most of our uh, profits from selling the consumables for each respective test. Lastly, uh, We've learned that the, the market is a, let me have it here, it's a $2.7 billion market, and it's growing at a 5% compounded annual growth rate, which is huge. So in the, in the near future, we hope to officially form our company. Uh, we'd like to secure funding for a small manufacturing and uh, equipment to run our tests. And lastly, we would like to hire a small marketing and, and sales team to uh, help uh, advertise our technology. And lastly, we'd like to find experienced biotech business advisors to uh, help advise us in our future endeavors because I'm a biochemist, you know, I don't know anything about this. So <laughs> that is, that's the truth. <laughs> and so basically, yeah, that's it. We, we want to be able to help people monitor their environment in a way that's safe and easy to use. And for the time being, I'm Barrett Marl with Clean Rich, Clean Reach, and I'm here to help protect you when fecal matters. And I'd like, to, I'd like to introduce the next startup, Ar Ar Arborizer. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you, ATI SEAL, for this opportunity. Uh, also, a special thank you to, oh, sorry, to uh, our mentor. Dr. Gregory Stein for all his wonderful feedback to, uh, through this program. My name is Degle de Lenes and I represent the Arborizer, which is a better tool for treating brain tumors. So glioblastoma is 
a very common and very malignant brain tumor. Sorry about that. And it's, it's associated with very poor patient survival. So this year, approximately 12,000 people will be newly diagnosed with glioblastoma. And even if they get, and even if they uh, get the best standard of care, which includes uh, surgery, radiation, and systemic chemotherapy, the average patient survival is only 12 to 15 months. Now, there's various challenges that render these treatments ineffective, but one of those challenges is accessing all the malignant cells or um, that are present in the uh, surrounding uh, healthy tissue that is called the tumor margins. And the other challenge is getting enough chemotherapy to bypass the blood-brain barrier, uh, which is a protective uh, mechanism in the capillaries of the brain. So due to the shortcomings of the current treatments, there's been uh, various alternative methods under investigation. And one that has shown promise is convection enhanced delivery, or CED. CED involves uh, creating a hole in the skull, inserting a small catheter, and directly pumping chemotherapy to the tumor. However, in these clinical trials, clinicians have used one or multiple of these uh, commercially available uh, uh, off-the-shelf catheters that have not been specifically designed for CD therapy. And so they have resulted in a very poor uh, drug distribution, so they have not been able to cover the tumor margins, and so uh, the, the tumor tends to reoccur and is um, resulting in a poor prognosis to the patient. So we are the eyebrizer. We are a better tool that we could potentially increase the efficacy of CD therapy. The arborizer consists of a primary cannula that uh, then, once inserted into the tumor, can branch out uh, smaller uh, microneedles. These needles branch out and deliver the drug in a very, uh, ex to extensively cover the tumor and target the tumor margins. We are delivering the drug locally so that we can minimize systemic uh, effects. We um, can position these microneedles to customize the infusion uh, so that we can prevent uh, damage to healthy tissue or, and avoid other critical structures. These, uh, ma uh, these microneedles are minimally invasive, which means uh, they're only microns in diameter, but they are made out of hollow optical fibers. So we can co-deliver both laser energy and the drug. The laser energy heats the tissue, and we have found that it can increase volumetric dr drug dispersal by 60 to 80% in, in, in a live animal uh, brain. So right now we are in the development stage. We uh, hope to build a more robust prototype and with the goal of building a company uh, by next summer. Um, we will then uh, conduct preclinical studies in a larger animal so that we can validate the performance of, our, of, of the arborizer with the goal of uh, seeking regulatory approval as a drug delivery device and launch our market in the summer of 2019. In parallel, we also hope to uh, partner with drug developers so that we can um, seek uh, uh, clinical trials and pre-market approval as a combination product to treat uh, glioblastoma. Our business models uh, includes our customers, which are neurosurgeons that are interested in a better tool for treating brain tumors. We have a production cost that uh, includes a base unit, which is the uh, laser and the, and the fluid pump that will be used with the arborizer. This base unit will be sold at cost, but then our revenue will be generated by selling the arborizer as a disposable product. So right now we are more of an academic team. We uh, have not created our company yet, but we have uh, assembled a highly skilled uh, development team with expertise in engineering, medicine, and cancer biology in order to move our product forward. So through the SEAL program, I've learned a lot. Um, I learned that our market opportunity expands beyond uh, our brain tumors to also include uh, metastatic brain tumors, and we can also use our device to treat focal brain disease. We have um, uh, made a more in-depth analysis of a competitive landscape in order to define our value. Um, we also had the opportunity to speak to uh, various neuro-oncologists and neurosurgeons 
so that, and we got their clinical perspective so that we can uh, improve our design. And lastly, we investigated uh, regulatory strategies so that we can get our product uh, to the market quicker. So our final decision is that we uh, will proceed with the development of the Arborizer. We have uh, spoken with very interested, interested parties in establishing a company, uh, hopefully by next year, and we will submit uh, secret grants uh, funding applications and then uh, go th through, um, proceed from there. Thank you. Um, the, ne the next team is WASD Play. What's up, Austin? All righty. How you guys doing? I'm AJ, and I'm with WASD Play, the eSports Tournament Authority. Now, eSports is huge, but not very well known. Around the world, there are 200 million people that are in the, in the market. Uh, and it's getting bigger every day. It's no surprise then that more people are watching esports than watch regular sports. Um, the League of Legends tournament drew in more viewers than the NBA Finals and the Stanley Cup combined. And League of Legends is only one game within the realm of esports. Why is this? Okay, something's on the computer, by the way. Um, so, esports fans. They're hungry for information about esports. It's a huge industry, but there's actually a really big problem. They can't find esports tournament information. They're sifting and wasting time looking through multiple websites trying to find the information they need. WASD Play consolidates esports tournament news, events, and streaming all in one place. We serve it up on a fast, easy to use website. Um, Oh gosh, on fast, easy to use website built using the latest um, in web development um, architecture. Oh gosh. <laughs> unlike regular sport, unlike regular sports, where doing what the pros do is seemingly impossible. With esports, players can not only watch their favorite streamers play, they can also play with their favorite esports players. This new dynamic between esports professionals and esports fans means that esports fans can actually train with professionals to hone in their skills, and they have. They've completely mastered their craft, but there's a problem. There's no way for them to apply their, new, their newly learned skills and techniques. There needs to be an outlet for competitive, um, for an actual competition in esports. Um, esports competitions and tournaments are what esports is all about. Playing and beating someone in your underwear at home online is much different and a whole nother ball game than actually going out and competing in a real life setting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> WASD Play hosts these real life tournaments so that any gamer can uh, test their skills out in the real arena. Um, the, um, we believe this is the best way to contribute to esports as a whole and to deliver um, revenue back to us in uh, three main forms, uh, tickets, sponsorships, and advertising. Our team is made up of entrepreneurs and computer scientists who have a passion for gaming and always have. But we are a young bunch and we realize this. So we've enlisted the help of um, of mentors and advisors along the way, uh, such as Mark Robinson from UTSA, who has been invaluable in the technical development of our website, and people like Jay and David here at ATI, who have helped us in, uh, and introduced us to um, some very influential people and speakers and given us remarkable insight into our own company. When we started ATI, we thought we had it in the bag. We knew what we were doing, we knew where we were headed, we knew how to get there, Route 66. Uh, but our scope, we found out, was way too broad. We found out that our revenue model, our revenue stream, was just a trickle. We had to go back, research, and interview gamers, and we actually came out much better. We came out with a subset of gamers that we are now targeting that's much, um, I guess, easier and profitable to get to. Um, we also have discovered a new revenue stream that we can now explore. Uh, but that's not all we learned. So the whole time we've been doing this, we've been trying to deliver the same immersive experience you get from gaming into our website. And it took us ATI, it took us and ATI's uh, mentors 
to help us realize that what we needed to do was completely remake our website into a completely um, different architecture. So what we did is we started with a simple, um, I guess, tr your traditional multi-page website model and switched it over to a new, modern, and streamlined single-page web app. Um, with the, uh, the help, mentorship, and knowledge that we gained here at ATI, we at WAC Play feel extremely confident in turning our vision into a reality. Thank you very much. My name is AJ with WASD Play. I, I, I skipped a lot of stuff, by the way, just saying. So we'll be doing another uh, five minute break.
Okay, guys, we're, uh, we're about ready to have the final flight of teams. So if people could be moving towards taking their seats, that would be appreciated. So while people are taking their while people are taking their seats, there are some folks I uh, want to make sure we say thank you to. People, Shh. shushing sound, shushing sound, shushing sound. Uh, some people I want to make sure we say thank you to. Um, this has been put on by a group of people who have worked on a really dedicated basis for the entire summer. Dave Altunin, you've met. Um, you haven't met Jay Brown. Jay, could you come on up here for a sec? And you have not met Tony Miranda. Tony, could you come up here as well? Or Ryan Field. Ryan, could you come up here too? And lastly, Amy Mosley. Amy, could you come up? So these are people who have been working on a day-to-day -day basis. By come up, I actually mean come up here on, on stage. Jay. Yeah, yeah, come on up. Come on up. Come on up, Jay. Uh, Jay has been our super intern who's been running this thing over the summer. Jay is a recent graduate in psychology. Did I get that right? From the University of Texas. He's been putting in way more hours. He's been putting on his timesheet. Don't tell anybody. We appreciate it. Uh, Ryan Field uh, is the uh, research manager at ATI and has been was involved in most of the early uh, Kaufman part of this. Uh, Amy Mosley has been running a lot of the logistics. And Tony, come on up here with me. Tony's from Texas A&M University and has been the person who has been doing most of the coordination with our other university partners. So please join me in thanking this group of people. Thanks, guys. And, and now you can leave the stage. <laughs> OK, thanks. And with that, we'll turn Oops, Oh, and we have our next contestant. Thank you. What if you were hospitalized and had a central line catheter placed in your body? And I told you that you have a 25% chance of dying if you get an infection. I'm Mitchell Greenberg with Scepter Medical Devices. I'm a graduate student at Texas A&M University, completing my MBA and master's in biomedical engineering. And here at Scepter Medical Devices, we not only have a solution that saves lives, but also reduces the cost of healthcare. Central line catheters such as this are commonly used in the ICU, as well as for chemotherapy treatment and dialysis. In the United States, there's over 30,000 central line catheter infections per year, and these are potentially fatal at one in four, leading to death. Also, these are the most expensive hospital-acquired infection to treat at $46,000 per infection. And this cost is directly to the hospital. They're responsible for this because this is a preventable infection. The market on this is huge. $1.7 billion is spent each year from hospitals treating inpatient infections from central line catheters. Additionally, $1.7 billion is spent by Medicare and insurance companies treating outpatient dialysis. These infections are preventable, but the current methods just aren't sufficient. Because a central line catheter goes into your bloodstream and leads to your heart, an infection is extremely dangerous. And the most common source of an infection is from bacteria entering the entrance site. So common methods being used now are chlorhexidine discs and sterile transparent dressings to prevent bacteria from getting to the entrance site. However, these just aren't adequate, and hospitals have adopted a zero tolerance policy because these are preventable infections. Since the most common source of infection is bacteria crawling down the catheter site, into the bloodstream. We believe we can prevent infections by using blue light to kill bacteria at the, at the entrance site. We do this through a two device system. One is a reusable light source and the other is a disposable wound dressing. We've identified a way to incorporate our device into the current hospital practices in standard, standard of care for infection prevention across the board for all central line catheters. We're non-disruptive by design and easily used by staff. 
Problems with previous blue light devices was that they were large, bulky, disruptive, and were not clinically effective. We've identified a solution to the, to the issues these previous devices had by creating this two device system that can be used with the current processes the hospitals implement now for infection prevention. So how does blue light work? Well, the blue light shines directly onto the bacteria and activates naturally occurring photosensitizers, which release reactive oxygen species that lead to DNA damage and eventually bacterial cell death. So our revenue model, we've got two revenue streams, our reusable light source and our disposable wound dressing. We're looking at a cost savings model because these are costs the hospitals are acquiring and are not being reimbursed for. So there's $1.7 billion in hospital costs as well as loss from Medicare reimbursement from the Affordable Care, uh, from the Affordable Care Act and $1.3 billion from just costs from hospitals treating infections. We believe we can capture a small percentage of this if we can reduce infections by 50% capture one third of that value would be $230 million of revenue potential per year. Here at ATI, this summer in the SEAL program, uh, we left no stone unturned. So um, what I found out through this process was that we had a narrow IP protection. We really needed to focus more on our user requirements and what the specifics of those would be, as well as more specifics on the functional requirements of our device. However, this was a promising, is a promising technology with large market opportunities and a huge impact on healthcare. So our next steps are to broaden our IP. We're gonna interview with hospital staff, better understand the requirements, the, down to the specifics. We're gonna work on our research and development for prototype design. This will allow us to refine our development and revenue models. So I'm calling this a slow go. Part of this slow go is actually the beginning of the regulatory process in our design history file. As you can see here, this image provided by the FDA shows the cyclic nature and in processes involved in medical device development. We have to look at the user needs, design inputs and outputs, and continually verify and validate them throughout the process. This is what we're gonna begin doing. This will allow us to prepare for FDA approval through a 510K process. Here's our development roadmap. This fall, we're gonna file our new provisional patent, file for an STTR grant, begin our new product design, use the funds from the STTR grant to, for prototype testing and preparing for a 510K. In 2018, we're gonna file our utility patent through Texas A&M University, license the technology. Once we have a finalized design, we'll be able to further evaluate the financial needs moving forward, as well as begin our approval for a 510K. Our team here at Scepter Medical Devices is well equipped for this process over the next few years and, and for beginning this business. We've got interventional radiologists, electrical engineers, biomedical engineers, and we couldn't do this without the help of our mentors. This summer, we had the help of Dr. Soberwal, who's, fam who's familiar with pharmaceuticals and medical devices, as well as Terry Chase, in, who's involved in Research Valley Innovation. If you'd like to learn more about Scepter Medical Devices and what blue light devices can do for the world, talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Manis. Uh, I'm with Eptronic. And at Eptronic, we're building the next generation of robotics through a whole new type of actuator. So an actuator is simply a robot muscle. It's what allows the robots to move. And it's at the core of all robotics today, whether it's an industrial robotic arm or an exoskeleton for rehabilitative robotics. They all use actuators to move. It's critical. But there's a huge problem with them. Just like with human muscles, when you exercise them, they heat up and so do robotic actuators. They heat up especially with repetitive, fast motions, much like you'd find in a natural human-like behavior. Uh, and this is really a limiting factor for fields like industrial automation, where you need to have uh, quick motions and repetitive motions. Um, this, is, this can be solved in one of two ways. You can slow down the robot, which kind of is uh, opposite of what you would expect for a fast, efficient automation system to do or you can increase the size and weight. Now maybe you can get away with increasing the size and weight for something like uh, industrial automation, but where you really can't is with rehabilitative robotics. 
you can think about a prosthetic limb. You've got only so big that you can go and it's not gonna be functional anymore. And if you slow it down, instead of enabling someone, you're actually limiting the wearer. You're denying them that natural human-like motion that they desire. So at Uptronic, to address this heating issue, we have developed a new class of robot actuator that doesn't force you to compromise between these things. Um, we've been working for the past five or six years in the human-centered robotics lab at UT Austin to design this for every kind of use case that would require a natural, fast, repetitive motion. Uh, and we've kept it into a small, compact form factor uh, that's still really power dense. And we've done that through the use of an advanced technique of liquid cooling that gives you 50% more speed and 300% more power than you would have had otherwise. And this is very valuable for building those robots that are gonna seamlessly integrate into a factory floor and into our lives. Uh, we have patents pending on the core technology. And we're very excited to bring this to market. Now the markets here are all ones that crave an actuator that can do high performance, but be low weight and low size. The most interesting and I guess the most appealing one visually is the industrial automation market. It's very, very high volume. There's a lot of units out there, over a million today, and it's expected to reach $2.3 billion for our opportunity in actuators by 2018. Uh, but it's, it's more a mature market, uh, and we're a smaller part, a small but key part of their solutions in providing an actuator um, that makes their robots perform better. Uh, so it's not really where we provide the highest value. Where we provide the highest value is in military and aerospace space uh, and rehabilitative robotics. Now, rehabilitative robotics I mentioned earlier can range from anything from a prosthetic limb all the way to a exoskeleton that helps someone who's paralyzed walk again. And it's there and in the military space where we've seen the most desire for our technology. They're spending up to 60% of their resources to design and develop their actuators, and they do not want to be doing that anymore. They're actively searching for other people who can give them a tested, reliable actuator designed for their needs. And that's what we have at Eptronic. Um, you can see it's a very growing market uh, for rehabilitative robotics, and we're very interested in breaching it. Um, now, with the military and aerospace side, we've actually begun um, entering that, and that's part of our go-to-market strategy, is to go into rehabilitative robotics early and military and aerospace early, where they feel that pain and have that need. We're a big part of the solution, uh, but it's a bit smaller volume. Uh, so we're, we're broaching a, a partnership, a contract with Lockheed Martin currently uh, to, to give them actuators for their exoskeletons. Uh, so we have a lot of demand there, and actually in some cases, with contracts with uh, government entities, they're asking us to actually assemble the entire system solution. Um, but we really want to get at to that nice slice of the pie in industrial automation. So over the next six months, we're going to be doing a uh, design review to bring down the cost of our actuator twofold. And then through economies of scale and a, a very clever understanding of the manufacturing process, we can actually bring it down another factor of two to the point that we can enter into this really razor thin margin uh, market of industrial automation where they really desire our technology but they can't justify raising the price of their robot by that much for it. Um, so we have a, a pretty rock star team uh, consisting of Dr. Luis Sentis who's the leader of the Human Centered Robotics Lab at UT Austin where we are a spinoff from. Uh, he's had years of experience working with some of the most advanced robotic systems in the world uh, with NASA, with uh, Valkyrie, with As Asimov. Uh, we have the leadership of General Bill Welsh, retired General Bill Welsh, uh, who is our CEO and guides us every day on our tasks. Uh, and we have the genius of Dr. Nick Payne, who's our resident expert on actuators and robotics. Um, and he has been working on this for the past five or six years. And then on the business side, we're the ones who are trying to make this a, a viable venture. Uh, and we think we've gotten a lot more towards that because of the SEAL program. Uh, with the, the help of the SEAL program, the mentorship, the teachings, I've learned a considerable amount as to how to actually evaluate the different markets. You know, when we first started this program, it was, where do we take this? This is a fantastic technology. How do we take this from uh, this proto company that coming out of the lab into a real market segment? Uh, and with thanks to the mentors, uh, the SEAL staff, and even uh, talking and learning from other team members, uh, we, we've narrowed it down onto these three segments. Uh, and we are very excited because we have the biggest value here and the biggest opportunity there. And we didn't waste our resources finding that out by going into all of these. So it was a very um, worthwhile opportunity. We're very thankful for the experience. 
Um, and with that, I would like to say that Eptronic is a big go. We're very excited to continue on with the contracts we're developing, uh, and we're very excited for what the future holds. So thank you very much. Cool. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Eric Beydoun, and I am CEO of Wave. And at Wave, we produce a cost-effective and sustainable gel that efficiently removes heavy metals and harmful chemicals from water. Initially, Wave will focus on the heavy metal market because it has lower barriers to entry. Now, in this market, we'll focus first on chrome problems. So. The chrome industry is a very small industry. It's a $21 million industry. We want to enter it just to do pilot testings. We want to test the flow rate, higher volumes of water, what actually happens to the gel. From that data, we'll bring this over to the selenium market. Now we're talking a $10 billion market. With that, we're partnering with Veolia through the whole process, even the chrome industry, to know what data they want and actually import it to their bigger pilot plants. Now, what's our problem? in the selenium industry with specifically power plants. Their problem is three things. One, regulation just got stricter. Regulation on the water coming out of this plant on the selenium content has to be now 70% stricter in still water and 38% stricter on running water. Also, the current technologies they're using, there's a lot of technologies, but they're expensive and they often use a multi-stage filtration system adding cost. And the third big problem is the disposal cost. We're talking about selenium. You can't just dispose of it easily. You have to send it to a waste management uh, third party. So our solution is the cost-effective gel. It's cost-effective because the raw material is shrimp shell. And shrimp shell is a waste from another industry, making our raw materials very cost-effective. Now what happens is our gel is positively charged, and any negatively charged ions next to it get it adsorbed onto the gel. And we have two formulation patents on it and a trade secret on the production of it. Our business model is initially to sell a system with the gel in it. In use, the gel will get a reach capacity. We can regenerate this gel over 10 times. And at the end of its lifetime, send the gel to those disposal companies as they do today. Uh, the fourth interesting step, it's, it's a simple razor blade model. We'll just continue supplying the gel. Now, the team behind it is Dr. Enrico Nadris, our lead scientist, and the postdoc of the inventor who worked on the gel. Uh, Dr. Pavan Raja, who's working on scaling up the production of the gel, myself, and we're currently looking for a new business partner. Our advisory board is Dr. Deborah Rodriguez, the inventor of this technology, and the scientific advisor. Michael Bridges, the chemical engineer advisor, and Dwayne Dunk, our market and business advisor. They each have more than 20 years of experience in the water industry. Now, our roadmap is that to date, we have raised over $400,000 non-dilutive, so that's through grants and business plan competitions. Um, we are right now installing our first chrome pilot in a chrome plant, um, and our goal is to raise over $500,000, or exactly $500,000, by December 2016, this year, to scale up the production and really bring a bigger pilot in those power plants. So what we learned through SEAL is two main things. The chrome industry is pretty small. But the second point is that we can still use it. Pilots in, chrome, in the chrome industry is pretty cost effective for us. So we can test at higher volumes than what we have in the lab. So we want to start pilot on chrome and then grow on the selenium market. So the whole go-to market strategy has been redefined through this whole uh, accelerator. So, of course, we are a go. My name is Eric Beydoun, and we are WAVE, redefining clean water. Thank you. And next is Wilder Systems. I don't know about y'all, but for me, it's been kind of a long day. Is everyone still with me? Good, good. Start my MBA this week, and so it's just full time here at McCombs. Okay, so um, my name is Will Wilder. 
I started Wilder Systems uh, with the goal of integrating cost-effective robots in airplane manufacturing. Okay, so the mission is to integrate robots directly into existing production lines without major reconfigurations. Um, me personally, in the last five years, I've worked at a different robotic startup, but in that capacity, I've visited over 30 plants and, on three continents and uh, executed about five major system integration projects in aerospace. So I've got a background in aerospace robotics, and I liked it, so I want to keep going. So the problem is that in aerospace, drilling holes is very expensive because it requires specialized labor and sometimes expensive tools. So there's a lot of holes to drill uh, here in aerospace. So Boeing and Air Airbus have a combined backlog of 12,000 aircraft, and uh, both Boeing and Airbus are targeting 60 single aisles a month. That's 60 737s a month and 60 A320s a month. And each of those aircraft, for example, have about 7 million fasteners, that's 7 million holes. Um, and then at the same time, we've got to bring the costs down. For Those two manufacturers have to bring the costs down because there's some competition uh, on the horizon from uh, China and Canada and Brazil. So, for example, here's a typical wing assembly cell. This is an F-18, and there's about 700 holes per side, um, and it takes about 230 minutes to drill. Uh, each side of that wing, and it's done by hand with a pilot, like manual power drills, like a, by hand. So um, that's defect prone and expensive. Uh, there's three possible solutions. On the left, you've got a semi-manual tool. Um, the problem is it's still one operator, one hole. On the right, you've got a giant installation. It weighs 200 tons, runs on train tracks, and it's a very long lead to procure a system like that. In the middle, uh, I have the Wilder Systems lightweight mobile gantry, and it's what I call right size automation. That device interfaces with existing jigs in the plant, identifies what jig it's on, and then knows which part program to execute. So key benefits are pro uh, cost savings through uh, process time, and uh, they're quick to procure. And at the same time, operators are free to do other tasks. They're still gonna be manual tasks. And it's network enabled, so there's a server which uh, stores data about process time. So I worked this summer with the SEAL program at ATI and uh, defined three key uh, things to work on. So IP strategy, um, did some market research, and then refined my company development plan. So if, um, in June, I filed a, a provisional patent for the system, and we laid out a strategy for um, how to build out a well-rounded IP platform, including utility patents for the machine, some of the software, and then the end effector itself, which is the business end of the robot. Uh, research. So with one of the ATI interns, we made a heat map. Um, the, each of those uh, dropped pins is a structural airplane manufacturing facility in the United States. And so uh, we did that in order to identify which markets to target first. So you can maybe get multiple contracts in the same city and get some economies of scale with your applications engineers. Um, then we developed a company roadmap. Um, so basically, I, I founded this company uh, as a Washington State LLC last September. Um, and then in uh, June, filed a provisional patent. Uh, this fall, th this summer, I did a lot of mechanical design and some software architecting. And through the fall, um, I'll be finishing up the second prototype end effector, um, followed by NSF SBIR grant proposal in order to fund a full scale prototype next summer. And uh, let's see, that's the important things. We plan to, I plan to do funding through business plan competitions. And as I mentioned earlier, I started an MBA at the University of Texas. So one of the primary things that I'm hoping to get out of that is find some business partners who are interested in entrepreneurship and robotics that are like motivated, driven people. So I, I expect to find that. Um, yeah, okay. So in conclusion, um, Wilder Systems it exists to build and market cost-effective robotics for aerospace. And uh, thank you, SEAL, ATI SEAL, for your time and all the mentorship. And special thanks to John and David Altunian for uh, their time this summer. So thank you. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Omid Shams. 
I'm the founder and CEO of Quest, and uh, I'm here tonight because local tourism sucks, but we're going to change that. Let's say right now anyone in this room is looking to go out and explore a new place in their city. Okay, what are your options? One, you have the obvious sweaty bus tour. Okay, these are inconvenient, and bottom line, millennials and locals don't want to do them. Okay, two, you have your do-it-yourself option. So Yelp, Foursquare, TripAdvisor, these all provide really, really great reviews, but nothing curated and nothing engaging once you're there. And lastly, you have the do-it-yourself tour apps, okay? I think these do a pretty good job of engaging you once you get there, but bottom line, they're still taking that sweaty bus tour, and they're just condensing it into these bland audio and text screens that are not really interactive. Whoops. And so that's why Quest is offering something entirely different, this brand new, better way to explore your city using your smartphone as a guide. Okay, Quest is 50% scavenger hunt, 50% guided tour, and 100% awesome. Our platform launches our users out onto this interactive real-world adventure. So we take people to a series of amazing places and hidden gems, and we tie all those places together with location-based riddles, uh, puzzles, mini games, and even augmented reality. So our users can not only have a great time exploring their city, but they can also complete challenges to unlock discounts and to earn free swag. Imagine you open up the Quest app, okay, you select your city and you select your adventure. You show up at the starting line and from there, you're presented a variety of unique and interesting challenges to guide you from place to place. So currently, we have over 15 different interactions or experiences that you can actually run across when you're on a Quest. So these are things like lightning rounds, which are 60 seconds of fast-paced question and answers for the adrenaline junkies. Uh, you have uh, GPS compass, which is like geocaching on steroids. Uh, image recognition, which allows you to play hide and seek with objects in the real world, and augmented reality, which actually brings these real world objects to life. So with this example, I like to use Pokemon Go with the, with the epidemic going on, right? So our experiences are sort of like Pokemon Go, only we're not really having you focus on the phone the whole time and you're not really getting hit by cars. So uh, in terms of business model, so long term, we're looking to monetize through in-app purchases, right? Users will purchase Quest experiences and we'll have in-app content you can unlock. Um, once we achieve certain milestones for user and partner growth, we're also planning on uh, opening up location-based advertising for our merchant partners. So they'll be able to reach customers when they're right outside or even inside of their location. But in the short term, while we're really focusing on product market fit and platform growth, we're monetizing and we're pulling in some short-term cash flow uh, just through partnerships. So we're building quests for events, venues. Uh, so these are brands like Dallas Zoo, Reunion Tower, uh, Community Beer Co., Uber, just to name a few that we partnered with in Dallas. So who's the team that's making this a reality? Well, again, myself, my name is Omid Shams. I'm the founder and CEO. Uh, we have a very, very talented uh, tech guru, I like to call him. His name is Zun. Uh, he's built the entire platform himself up until this point. We have a UX specialist and we have a marketing chief. So uh, we've done everything up until this point with four guys uh, working part-time, completely bootstrapped. So I recently went full-time myself before the SEAL program, but everything has been bootstrapped up until now. And so kind of going through the motions of the program and talking with a lot of mentors, we finally decided that it's time to gear up and raise a seed round. So we're looking to go and raise our first seed round um, in order to really give us that rocket fuel for a good three-year runway with a full-time team of, of about six to seven individuals. So that's including the folks we have now, plus a couple gaps we're looking to fill. So a growth marketer, another engineer, and a quest commander. Now, talking specifically about the SEAL program, so when we started the program, again, we had, we had bootstrapped a product to market, we had hit some pretty decent micro traction, so steady user downloads, uh, we had some great partnerships and clients that we were able to lock in, uh, and most importantly, our market was giving us great feedback, so they were telling us, okay, we love these Quest experiences, but ultimately, our team was kind of scattered all over the place, we're trying to do too much with too little, uh, and we were trying to we're really ambitious in terms of we wanted to reach outside of Dallas sooner rather than later. So when we started the program, we're like, okay, we want to move into Austin. We want to move into LA, to New York. And so through the mentorship and through the guidance we got from the program, we kind of settled down. We said, okay, we need to focus on Dallas. We need to achieve product market fit in Dallas first before we decide to expand anywhere else. And so that's what we've been doing throughout the entire program throughout the summer is we put together a good strategy to hit product market fit in Dallas, and we've been executing on that strategy. So we completely kind of took a step back, we redid market discovery, we relearned who our early adopters really were in Dallas. So not just demographics, but really what they love. Uh, and so through that, we, we were able to recently come up with a new framework for our quest. So we're, we're kind of going back to the drawing board, we're rebuilding the foundation of quest. And ultimately this new framework is gonna allow us to uh, offer a more scalable, scalable platform, uh, more replayability in our experiences, and it's gonna enable us to offer a brand new business model that we're excited about. So. Uh, with that, in conclusion, you know, Quest is a go. We're going to continue working and, and striving towards our vision of ultimately changing the way we all explore the world. 
Uh, we're very thankful for the SEAL program, the mentorship, the guidance, the resources they've offered us. Uh, and we're excited for the next chapter. Thank you. All right, so we had two other teams, uh, R5 uh, Automation and Aeroclay, who unfortunately could not be here. R5 Automation um, is a qualified go with a major reset out of the program. Uh, and so they were not able to attend. And the other one is Aeroclay. Uh, R5 Automation does uh, oil field data analysis as, uh, as their main business. And uh, Aeroclay is an absorption clay and that team was in China and not able to get back in time. We actually had their uh, demos or their uh, pitches recorded, but uh, from our technology side, it just didn't play well. So we're not going to do that. If you're interested, uh, Jay Brown in the back has it over there and he can show you the videos, but we weren't going to try to do it up here. With that, I want to say thank you to the teams. As you can see, none of these are professional presenters and they all did a fantastic job. So how about a round of applause? And I'm going to pass over to Isaac to close. So thanks very much, Dave. Um, uh, once again, uh, teams, no, no more applause, but the teams did a fantastic job. I mean, this is hard stuff. A lot of these people are doing things that are really, really difficult. They're coming from engineering or scientific laboratories. They're trying to turn something into a business. Uh, it's absolutely amazing what they're doing. Really well done. I also want to just call out our partner universities. This is, you know, it's been hosted by the University of Texas, but it's really been a multi-university program. So uh, University of Houston, you can applaud for University of Houston, yay. <laughs> Texas A&M University. University of Texas San Antonio. They brought, they brought friends. University of Texas Dallas. Duke University. And uh, your tax dollars at work through Argonne National Laboratory. Um, I also just want to, in closing, thank our sponsors once again. Uh, Google Fiber, fantastic. We love the space. It's so easy to work here. Um, the folks at Beatbox and DLA Piper for, for the booze, which is helpful. We appreciate that. And mostly the Coffin Foundation, who allowed us to expand this to our partner universities. And just a last reflection for me. So at the Austin Technology Incubator, uh, over the past decade, we've worked with teams that have raised $892 million in investor capital and have created somewhere between $2.5 and $3 billion worth of, worth of value. Um, about $750 million of that's already exited. Um, we get kind of jaded sometimes uh, because we see a lot of really good opportunities. We have seen a lot of good opportunities. And frankly, it's easy for us to say, well, there's not a whole lot of room in the innovation landscape anymore. And an event like this, where you can see these teams coming up, taking really, really interesting, hard projects, innovating it off on a very core level, and translating that into the real economy through a startup so it can benefit people's lives, is incredibly inspiring. Fantastic job, guys. Really well done. Thank you. Uh, with. With that, if the teams can stick around, uh, please uh, enjoy what's left of the food, which apparently is just tortillas at this point, um, and, we, we, and, and, and some juice or something like that. And, and the, the lawyers are still hopefully buying alcohol for us. So, so please do stick around, mingle with the teams, and once again, great job, guys. Well done. Thank you.